welcome to the sixth training movie in the Coral Finder Toolkit training movie series. In an action-packed previous movie, we introduced the Meandering Key Group, learned some tips and tricks about working with meandering corals, and developed a recipe for the coral identification process when using the Coral Finder, both underwater and topside. Now we're going to quickly explore the massive and thick colony key group before moving on to some more tips and tricks at the heart of learning to separate the many coral genera. There is no need to show you how to use the key groups again. If you have any doubts, just review the previous two movies. What I want to do now is focus on two learning groups. A learning group compares and contrasts a small group of coral genera that I have identified are problem areas for anyone trying to learn Indo-Pacific corals. The learning group also provides simple recipes for solving these problems. These recipes may not be very exciting, but believe me, they are a whole lot better than not having a recipe. So, gentle viewer, think of my learning recipes as being like muesli. Not very exciting, but very good for you. You'll thank me later. Okay, back to the massive and thick colony key group. Let's start by defining just what we mean by a massive coral. The term massive coral colony infers that the colony is a mound or dome with roughly similar dimensions in any direction, like the colony on the left-hand side. If a coral grows flat in one dimension, then we might refer to that colony as submassive. This still keeps us in the massive key group. But when the colony becomes very flat, though still solid, we might say that the colony was thick and crusting. From the perspective of the coral finder's logic, somewhere between thick and crusting and thin and crusting, there is a transition to the thin plates key group. You will need to make this call regularly when you dive. Have an opinion and test yourself. You'll soon fine-tune your judgment. But be warned, the terms massive and submassive are very arbitrarily used. In coral identification, it helps everyone if when you say massive coral, you actually mean massive coral. All these forms are the one species. This is not unusual. The final shape of a colony is determined by many factors, among them physical habitat, competition with other species, and the disturbance history, which can include storms, impacts of runoff, sediment, nutrients, and even thermal stress. Whether a colony is massive or thick is determined by the coral's ecological history. With time underwater, you will recognise the complex life histories many reef species have had. Now inspect the massive or thick colony key group on the front page of your coral finder. Note how it specifically excludes corals with meandering coralites, which have their own key group. So by this reasoning, of the four corals shown here, we would pursue two using the massive key group and the other two using the meandering key group. Okay, so we've decided to use the massive key group. Now browse this key group's pages to see how it works. Note each page is based around simple, well-defined concepts. Wall type, scale, and surface textures. Let's follow how this approach pans out. On page 10 of the Coral Finder, we see some examples with coralites having separate walls and being less than 8mm across. By referring to the descriptions, we can further tease the genera apart using details of the scepter, costi, and ornament. Back at the front page of the Coral Finder, let's choose another example to browse. Go to page 12 to see how genera with septocosti and indistinct walls are handled. Note the three genera on this page, Samacora, Cosnorea, and Pavona. These three common genera are confusing for beginners, and for that reason they form our first learning group. This is another example of how the Coral Finder's design seeks to help you learn. It reduces a very large and complex problem to a series of manageable chunks. 
learning groups are good value and worth some investment of your time as they solve a problem that will get you to the next level. So, the first step in our recipe for coral identification happiness is to limit the scope of the problem. Congratulations, you've already done that by using the Coral Finder to get you to a lookalike page. So hopefully we are in the right ballpark. By recognising coralites with Septocosti, you narrowed your choice to just three genera. Knowing how to use these simple glossary concepts is the heart and soul of the Coral Finder. So let's pursue our three best bets. Read the genus character descriptions. If the coral we were trying to identify had very small coralites without obvious walls, contained in shallow valleys, we would favour Samacora and Cosnerea, and to a lesser degree, Pavona. So here are some tips and tricks to help the beginner work these things out. Those of you with youthful eyes will see that Samacora and Cosnerea have septocosti with a fine, granular texture. The rest of us will have to use a magnifying glass. You can compare and contrast Samacora and Cosnerea using the Coral Finder's close-up and black-and-white images. Then compare them with Pavona. After close inspection, you'll see Pavona has much clearer, non-granular septicosti. So underwater, you will need to check if the septicosti are granular or not. If they are clean and smooth, then suspect Pavona. In this close-up image, you'll see three classic Pavona features. One well-defined septocosti with an absence of defined walls. Two, these septocosti are clean and non-granular. Three, some sharp edged ridges scattered across the surface. These are characteristic of Pavona, although they are not always present. So, in summary, here's the rub. Check the scale, just do it. It's a really important reality check. The images below have very small septocostate coralites grouped in shallow valleys. Now we need to look closely at the septocosti themselves. Up close, we see these images of Samacora and Cosnerea have a fine granular texture to their septocosti. Now note the subtle scale difference between Samacora and Cosnerea. Learn to recognize the coarser, sugary texture of Cosnerea. It's a simple way of eliminating Samacora. Note also that this Cosnerea has some tentacles extended, which can sometimes mask the appearance. By contrast, the images of Pavona on the right show clear, well-defined, non-granular septocosti. Unless you are watching these movies in high definition, you may have trouble seeing this detail on screen. Just look at the Coral Finder to see this detail magnified. Then check the true scale again. So that's the end of the Septocosti Learning Group. If you make the effort here and now, you will be on your way to the next level in coral identification. Moving on, here is the subject matter for our next learning group. Please take the time to familiarise yourself with the separate and common wall pages of this section of the Coral Finder. Okay, now that you are familiar with these pages, you will notice four genera occur more than once. Favia, Pavites, Montastria, and Goniastria. Each of these genera have more or less rounded corallites, but with different wall structures. Together they make up the rounded corallite learning group, a learning group within the massive thick colony key group. Remember, these are just constructions of convenience that chunkalize the information to make it easier for learning. Here's the problem. To the beginner, Favia looks like Montastria, and Favites looks like Goniastria. Sometimes, Favia can also look like Favites. These genera are very common and are generally easily separated once you know how. Solving this learning group requires a little secret knowledge and some new terms related to the way the coral clones itself, a process known as budding. All colonial corals bud or clone new polyps, and their corallites, to grow and expand the colony. 
We don't generally take notice of budding in the coral identification process, except when trying to separate favia and montastria. But just be aware, all corals do it. So you not only need to understand what budding is, but also when to use it as an aid to identification. There are two types of budding we need to learn, intratentacular and extratentacular. Here are two examples of intratentacular budding in favia. Intratentacular just refers to the new polyp bud forming within the ring of tentacles. Here's a tip. Coral growth is not always a constant process, so be prepared to not find budding in a coral that's not growing. If you really want to find a coral's budding state, sometimes it pays to swim around and look for another example of the same coral. Here are some good examples of extratentacular budding where the buds form outside the tentacle ring and the oral disc. Note that a consequence of extratentacular budding is for the colony surface to sometimes appear crowded due to the new coralites. These illustrations, by the wonderful coral artist Jeff Kelly, no relative, are taken from Carly Veron's Corals of the World and show the different budding processes with the tissues removed. I find it helps to remember that budding is a three-dimensional process that builds a colony over time. You are therefore likely to have different budding stages in the same coral. Don't freak out, this is normal. So take an overview of the colony and don't fixate on one coralite alone. Sometimes a coral will unhelpfully show both types of budding, but a good look around the colony usually tells the story. So let's put this knowledge to work. Here are two well-behaved examples of favia and montastria, showing the classic differences. Note the scale. Not all colonies will be this helpful. But this is the mental image you need to channel. Note also the use of the words dominantly. There will be some exceptions to the rule with regards to budding. But as I said earlier, a good look around the colony or swim around the same habitat usually overcomes the problem. Here are two more examples using species with larger coralites. Again, not every characteristic difference will show each time. In reality, underwater, you learn to recognize the look of each genus, and when your suspicions are aroused, you look at the budding to confirm. Here's another example to help give you a sense of the natural variation in look and feel that you'll need to be able to work with. As with all things relating to corals, there is no substitute the time spent underwater learning the look and feel of genera. Those budding tips helped us identify the separate wall genera, favia and montastria. Now we will look at the common wall part of the same learning group, identifying favites from goniastria. Here we employ more secret knowledge. This time, it's the dark art of paliform lobes. Part of the problem with coral taxonomy is that it is based on a mixture of living and skeletal features. To become truly expert requires a good knowledge of the coral skeleton. Now I don't want you collecting corals for no good purpose, so look closely at these images so you can recognize paliform lobes underwater. I generally don't encourage divers to touch corals. They are happier and healthier if left alone. But if you really are trying to learn to recognize goniastria, you will need to see the paliform lobes. This is actually quite easy with practice. And here's a tip. Waft some water over the coral with your hand to encourage the polyp to withdraw into its skeleton. This often accentuates the presence of paliform lobes, making them easier to see. Goniastria can be a bit mysterious for the beginner, but its fine, regular, neat scepter do create a distinctive look. You just need to learn that look. Note, goniastria is often common in shallow and intertidal habitats, and also has some meandering species. And here's a tip, waft some water over the coral with your hand to encourage the polyp to withdraw into its skeleton. Now for favites. When side by side with goniastria, the differences are usually quite evident, but hard to put in the words. The lack of paliform lobes and the less neat scepter are good characters to focus on. Well, that finishes our epic journey through the rounded coralite learning group. I hope you can see how chunkalizing the problem 
helps the human mind to keep the coral chaos under control. By mastering the Coral Finder's glossary terms, key groups, and learning groups, you have the main tools needed to identify about 70 hard coral genera. Now here are a couple of general tips to close the movie. Some Fabia-like species can look as though they have common walls. That's cool. If in doubt, waft water over the polyps, encouraging them to withdraw, revealing a subtle separation. Always keep an open mind, and be prepared to change key group, even if it needs to bend the logic a bit. The reality is that the answer to most coral inquiries is in the coral finder somewhere. And if you are not seeing the answer, you probably just need to think laterally. Here, the upper image is actually a meandering coral with very short meanders. On first glance, you might have been tempted to try the massive coral key group. The bottom line in this example, Cosnorea, is that until you learn the look of the genus, you need to know the wall structure to confirm your identification. Waft water over the polyps, encouraging them to withdraw. Do this carefully so as to not damage the animal's tissue such that it might encourage infection. Well that's it. Now you have all the concepts you need to take on coral identification using the Coral Finder. Don't forget, you can use the Coral Hub's index pages to confirm your field IDs. Just go to this URL and click on the links for the genera you think you saw.